But this is one of the most important panels. And the reason for that is as much as Georgia is doing its homework, the United States is here and we've shown a lot of U.S. commitment to Georgia. We'll have a conversation about NATO later. It is really the European Union that is going to be the organization, the institution, that makes the biggest difference in the lives of everyday Georgians and that will set the tone for the way Georgian democracy develops over a very long period of time. So in order to have that discussion, and please let's um, re quickly reset. In order to have that discussion, we are very fortunate to have some very senior officials from the European Union uh, who are going to address uh, EU engagement with Georgia. Uh, of course, that fits into the framework of neighborhood policy, but anyone working on these issues knows that within the neighborhood framework, Georgia is a country that stands out for its ability to benefit from that, engage with that, develop that. And so we have people who have been every day working on exactly these issues within the European Union. Uh, in order to moderate the discussion and to introduce our speakers, uh, we have from the Center for European Reform, Ian Bond. Ian Bond is a former UK diplomat. He had been ambassador in Latvia. Uh, he had been a senior diplomat in Washington and is now with Charles Grant at the Center for European Reform. And what I'd like to do to keep things moving, because our EU visitors have only until 4 o'clock, and then we need to end the panel. We'll have a break then, but we really only have until 4 o'clock. Uh, we're going to uh, get this suited up. I'll hand the microphone over to Ian. He can do a little more uh, setting the stage with who the speakers are and their particular responsibilities, and we'll get right into the discussion. So thank you very much. And once he's mic'd up, we will pass this to Ian. You can have this. Just, just use this for now, and then they'll switch it for you. So yes, so we're, since we're short on time, uh, we're going to, we're just going to have you begin the introductions. Thank you, Ian. Okay. So, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Kurt. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to start speaking through two microphones, but at least for the time being, at least this one is working. Um, I mean, it's been a very interesting day's discussion, and I suspect that we're going to touch on many of the same themes um, today. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that transatlantic relations are more turbulent than they have been in a very long time. Uh, the basic consensus that we had on the future of Europe from the end of the Cold War, uh, the consensus that Dan Fried referred to about a Europe whole, free, and at peace, it seems to me is under a great deal of strain. Um, no one is talking about EU or NATO enlargement at the moment. I'm sorry to say that um, because you have a rather important job um, running NATO enlargement, uh, EU enlargement. Um, but I, I have noted that uh, you know, the, the biggest um, candidate who has been on the agenda for the longest time is Turkey. And the president of the European Commission said this morning that uh, Turkey was not going to proceed with its accession to the European Union for the foreseeable future. Um, and I, I, that, that seems to me to be realistic, um, but also it marks a sort of watershed um, in our attitude to, um, to enlargement. Some of the other underpinnings of the transatlantic relationship are also looking pretty frayed at the moment. Free trade and open markets. Uh, the Trump administration has made perfectly clear that it's not going to, uh, to proceed with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, uh, which is something that was worked on under the last administration, made quite slow progress, um, but nonetheless was a, in some ways an economic counterpart to, uh, to NATO, at least potentially. And at the same time, we're facing these big external threats. Um, Russia is flexing its muscles. Uh, we have the migration crisis, we have unresolved uh, crises in the neighborhood and further afield in Asia. So what I hope we can get in the next 40 minutes or so is what are the Europeans and the Americans going to do 
to face up to these challenges. And if there are ways in which our organizations could work better than they do, if the EU and NATO are not working as well as they could, what should we be doing to reform them? And what should the, the EU and the US do to reassure uh, like-minded partners uh, outside currently their, um, uh, their glassy uh, partners such as Georgia. So I have a great panel here to help me with these questions. Uh, I'm going to ask Defense Minister Isoria of Georgia to, uh, to be the first speaker, um, and then Christian Danielson, who is the uh, Director General for Enlargement in the European Commission, uh, Bridget Brink, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Europe and Eurasia in the, uh, in the State Department, and who I think you've served here twice, haven't you, in your yes. career? Right. So um, somebody who, who knows Tbilisi and knows Georgia very well. Uh, and then finally, Thomas Meyer Harting, who is now the Managing Director for Europe and Central Asia in the European External Action Service after a long and distinguished career in the the Austrian uh, diplomatic service, um, and a man who in the external action service probably has more than his fair share of conflicts to, uh, to worry about. But Minister Isoria, perhaps you could kick us off with about five minutes on how these questions look from a Georgian perspective. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Konizebis organizatorebs motsvevistvis cels martlat sainteresu celia ta gvaux gansakutrebuli sapudzueli imistvis rom vipikrot chelo atlantikuri urtertobis perspektivaze me ori natsilit minda davko chemi gamusla pirveli zogadat chelo atlantikuri urtertobis perspektivaze ikneba Sakartolos, perspectivaze, Ratenkre integrated Bulikos Amsurces. Rachekeba Pirul Nazils, the Amtslis Gamolobashi Dinamikas, when Quelamitsitrom, Eurocomissian, Indinaritz Lis, Tirol Marts, Camusa, Tetritz Igni, Romilzeheba, Europis, Momawals, Kansakutrebi, Trogoriundaikos. Europa Orietas Ozda Hutitz Listuis, Tamerti Component, Yaris Machoris, Taudatsuis Peroshi, Turogunda, Tanam Shobobden, Eurocausiris, Seori Kornebi, Am Documenti Sapuzol, Zegamoitsa, Hutimi Martule, Bitaseve, Strategi Uli Documenta B, Machoris Ertetieheba Taudatsuas, the Zilta, the structure and document of Isaris, Isarut Armut Genilio, Maris Garco, Scena Rebi, Ganuitarebis, and Warari, concrete Uli Upirat Esipositia da Pixirebuli, the Saubari, Imazum, the Gartes Tuara, Euro Kaushiri, Taudot Swiss Kaushiri, Momolshi, Mean Positia, Sota Skepticura do Kureb, Toproim Scena Swem Hrobi, Robert Sambobstrom, Salkel Speroshi, Outsilebelia, Tanam Shomlobis Gadzli Reba, Agatha du Saptobis Peroshi, Terrorist Tan Zolis to Asadisit, Social Urs Peroshi, Economicus Peroshi, Tumsa, Taudot Swiss Peroshi, Ascetic Auschiri, Shekmis, Perspectivas, Mepira da Dufheda, Gaundina Rikidan Rome, Arsebops, Ams Peroshi, Kerzo Taudot Swiss Peroshi. Zalian Zlieri organizacija, Zarma Tebuli organizacija, NATO Sahit, Romil Zari Storec, Dilu Atlantiku, Risilci, Susab Tobis, Tamachoris, Eurokauši, Susab Tobis, Nišnelovani Garanti, Romil Zari Čventuis, Kartolebis, Tuis Mholod, Samhedro, Integracija iz Tuasa, Zistit Nišnelovani, Aramet Čventuis, Rogorc, Hirebule Bebis, Spero, Hirebule Bebis, Sazuga Dueba, Sadat Chuem Hedot, Chueni, Twitum Opadobis, Gadzli Rebas, the Ganu Tarebas, Sadat Chuem Hedot, Chueni, Democrat Uli, Pierce Uli, Ganu Tarebis, Sadlebubas, Amitom, 
ჩვენს პერსპექტივა მეორე ნაწილზე რო გადავიდე საუბრის, როდესაც ჩრდილოეთლა ატლანტიკურ სივრცის სივრცეში ინტეგრაციაზე საუბარი ხედავთ სწორედ ნატოში ინტეგრაციით, ხედავთ სწორედ ჩრდილოეთ-ატლანტიკური სივრცის გაძლიერებაში, ევროკავშირის გაძლიერებაში, ეს თითქმის ყველა დოკუმენტშია დაფიქსირებული, მათ შორის იმ რომის დეკლარაციაში, რომელიც სწორედ ევროკავშირის მომავალ სიძლიერეს სწორედ ხედავს ერთიანობაში. ამიტომ ფიქრობ ის პრობლემები და გამოწვევები, რომლის წინაშეც დგას დღეს ნატოს წევრი ქვეყნები და განსაკუთრებით ევროკავშირის ქვეყნები ვერ გადაიჭრება ახალი ინსტიტუტის ფორმირებით, თუ არსებული ინსტიტუტის ფარგლებში არ იქნება ტრანსფორმაციის მზაობა, განსაკუთრებით იმ მიმართულებით, რასაც როგორც უელსის ისე ვარშავის სამიტის შემდეგ ნატოს ოთხი ძირითადი მიმართულება ქვია. ეს არის პირველი რიგში ის რომ GDP იყოს თითოეული ქვეყნის 2% თავდაცვაში მიმართული, სამწუხაროდ თქვენ ვიცით რომ ევროკავშირის ხოლო ხუთი ქვეყანა ზად ასეთი ნაბიჯი გადადგას დღეს მონაცემებით. თქვენ ვიცით რომ ერთ-ერთი მეორე მიმართულება გახლავთ ის რომ აღჭურვილობისთვის იყოს ასევე თანხები გამოყოფილი თავდაცვის ბიუჯეტიდან 8% და ეს არის ასევე პრობლემა გამოწვევა და ჩვენ ვფიქრობთ რომ ა სწორედ ჩვენი ინტეგრაციის პროცესი მიმართულია იმისკენ რომ პირველი ეს მოთხოვნები და ნატოს მნიშვნელოვანი სტრატეგიული მიმართულებები დავაკმაყოფილოთ პირველი ჩვენ ვაკმაყოფილებთ მოთხოვნას რომ ჩვენი თლიან შიდა პროდუქტის 2% მიმართულია თავდაცვის ბიუჯეტზე ჩვენ მნიშვნელოვანი რეფორმების შედეგად ჩვენი თანხების უმეტესობა მიუმართეთ სწორედ თავდაცვითი ინფრასტრუქტურის შექმნისკენ და შეიარაღებისკენ, რაც არის ასევე ნატოს მოთხოვნა. ჩვენ ასევე მნიშვნელოვან კონტრიბუციას ვეწევით საერთაშორისო მისიებში ნატოსთან ერთად და მინდა ხაზგასმით აღვნიშნო, რომ ჩვენს კონტრიბუციას მხოლოდ თავდაცვით ასპექტში არ ხედავთ, არამედ ჩვენ ვავითარებთ რეგიონში იმ ღირებულებებს, რომელზეც ნატოა დაფუძნებული ეს არის კანონის უზენაესობა, ადამიანის უფლებები, სამართლებრივი სახელმწიფოს პრინციპი, რითაც ნატო შეიქმნა და ამით პოლიტიკურ კონტრიბუციასაც ვეწევით სამხედრო კონტრიბუციასთან ერთად. და ვფიქრობ რომ მეორე ნაწილზე რომ გადავიდე მნიშვნელოვანია სწორედ ღია პოლიტიკის მაქსიმალურად აქცენტირება ჩვენ წელს ყავდა მნიშვნელოვანი სტუმარი ამერიკის შეერთებული შტატებიდან ვიცე-პრეზიდენტი რომელმაც ხაზგასმით სხვა პრინციპულ და ძალიან კაფიო მესიჯებთან ერთად განაცხადა რომ ბუქარესტის სამიტის გადაწყვეტილება უნდა აღსრულდეს და საქართველო უნდა გახდეს ნატოს წევრი ქვეყანა ჩვენ გვაქვს ნატოსთან უელსის სამიტის შედეგად ასებითი პაკეტი რომელიც ძალიან წარმატებულად ხორციელდება ჩვენ ასევე როგორც თავში მოგახსენეთ შეკავების პოლიტიკის ფარგლებში ნატოსთან ერთად და განსაკუთრებით ჩვენ ყველაზე მთავარ სტრატეგიულ პარტნიორთან ერთად ამერიკის შეერთებულ შტატებთან ერთად ვახორციელებთ და ვიწევთ საქართველოს თავდაცვის მზადყოფნის პროგრამას რომელიც გულისხმობს მთავარს როგორც ნატოს წევრი ქვეყნებისთვის ისე პარტნიორი ქვეყნებისთვის თავდაცვის შესაძლებლობების ადგილზე გაძლიერებას ამიტომ ჩვენი მომავალში სამწლიანი წუთნები ამერიკის შეერთებულ შტატების ინსტრუქტორებთან ერთად მიმართული იქნება არა მხოლოდ საერთაშორისო მისიებში ჩვენი ამოცანების განხორციელებისკენ არამედ ადგილზე ტერიტორიული თავდაცვის გაძლიერებისკენ ამიტომ ესეც მნიშვნელოვანი კომპონენტია სწორედ ნატოს შეკავების სტრატეგიის მნიშვნელოვანი დინამიკა ჰქონდა ასევე ნატოს წევრ ქვეყნებთან და პარტნიორ ქვეყნებთან მრავალეროვნული წუთნების ჩატარების თვალსაზრისით ეს ყველა მიცით წელს და ერთადერთი ვიცი რომ დღეს დროში ვარ შეზღუდული მე მაქვს თხოვნა და მე მაქვს პოზიცია განსაკუთრებით ევროკავშირის ქვეყნების მიმართ რომ ევროკავშირის ქვეყნებმა მოსახლეობა მეტი იცოდეს საქართველოს კონტრიბუციის შესახებ ავღანეთში თუ რა საკეთებს ქართველი ჯარისკაცი როგორც პოლიტიკურ ასპექტში ქვეყანა 
განვითარებისთვის ისე ჯარისკაცი პოლიტიკურ ასპექტში და სამხედრო ასპექტში მათი უსაფრთხოებისთვის და გლობალური უსაფრთხოებისთვის რადგან რო დაასრულო ჩვენი საერთო მიზანია სწორედ წესებზე დაფუძნებული მსოფლიოს უზრუნველყოფა და თუ რა წვლილი შეაქვს საქართველოს ამისთვის ყველა ერთხმად უფრო მეტი უნდა ვისაუბროთ ევროპაში მაგლუთ Thank you very much minister. Um I think that's very clear. Um if I can just ask one very quick question. Um I mean it's important that Vice President Pence restated the Bucharest commitment. Um but the reality is that uh very many European countries uh, would not support any more NATO enlargement. Um and I'm not sure Uh, what your strategy is in that situation chuani strategia aris zalian principuli zalian mkapio chuem mkhedavt nato shi integratsias rogorts chuani eronuli tvit realizebis proces svata shoris ekhla tsina panelze ბატონმა ყოფილმა პრემიერ-მინისტრმა თქვა რომ ის არის ერთ-ერთი კომისიის წევრი რომელიც რჩევებს აძლევდა თავრობას და ამ კომისიამ ძალიან მნიშვნელოვანი დოკუმენტი დადო 2015 წელს სადაც ყველა პროცესი იქნება ეს ღირებულებების იმპლემენტაციასთან დემოკრატიული სამხედრო რეფორმასთან გაგებულია როგორც თვით რეალიზების პროცესი როგორც ეროვნული იდენტობის გამოხატულების და ღირსების დაცვის მნიშვნელოვანი მექანიზმი რომ იყო ღირსეულ საზოგადოების წევრი სადაც შენ სუფლებებს იცავენ სადაც ინსტიტუტებია დამოუკიდებელი და შესაბამისად ნატოში ინტეგრაცია ეს არის ჩვენი განვითარების ჩვენი ნაციონალური რეალიზების და დემოკრატიული პროცესის შემადგენელი ნაწილი და მე ვფიქრობ რომ ამას ადეკვატური პასუხი უნდა ქონდეს ყველა ქვეყნისგან ვისაც დემოკრატია სურს გლობალურად მსოფლიოში Okay, well I hope very much you're right. Christian Danielson, how does it look from Brussels? Um you have this this difficult portfolio of uh, enlargement from the EU perspective. Uh where is it going now? Yeah, uh, I have also in fact neighborhood which uh, includes Georgia and uh, the neighbor our neighbors and partners to us the south including Syria, Libya, and Egypt and uh, and Morocco to mention a few if you allow me just to perhaps uh, as you went out with a fairly straightforward comment on the situation perhaps you would allow me just to make yeah. three points one is on the situation in the EU right now the second is in relation to partners and the third one is perhaps a two words on how well we work with the United States uh, starting with the situation in the EU today that was very exact changed If we would have been sitting here a year ago it would be gloomy we would have painted a fairly dark picture brexit has just uh, been announced issues were in the wrong direction today it's another atmospheric uh, we are in the fifth year of uh, economic growth the unemployment is the lowest since 2008 and there is a unify unifying positions coming forward in various important discussions one being brexit but also in relation to other elements on of the challenges that we have in front of us that being said The challenges that we are having in front of us are substantial and without going into too much of detail I think one can put them together into three catch words one is security and that has to do with security in the sense that just was discussed from the by the by the defense minister but also security in terms of fighting terrorism and everything that comes with it into including national organized crime the second is the whole issue of refugee slash migration which has sort of changed which has had very quite far reaching uh, effects into the, the the discourse and the discussions within the EU and the third one is the economy and that's where the focus will be so that's within the EU as such and i would for those who are interested recommend for reading in fact the speech that was held today by the president of the commission setting out in quite clear language what his vision is on how this should move forward having the time perspective of 20 25 turning then to to uh, relations with with partners which is a priority 
And it's a priority because it's in the EU's interest. It's in the interest for the reasons I mentioned, economy, security, but also migration. But it's also in the interest of spreading the values that we stand for with democracy, rule of law, which today is not, how shall I put it, shared by a majority of the people of the world, if you can put it like that. Uh, so for that reason, we are putting quite strong efforts into it. And one element of that is enlargement. And I would like to correct you on one point. The pre president of the commission today said that he mentioned Western Balkan, and he made it clear that we need to be prepared, we in the European Union, to be more than 27 by 2025. So there is a time frame in it. He didn't put it that clearly in 2025, but that's how I read it and understood it. So we need to be, we need to be and that shows the preparedness which is there, which is real and, and something that we are going to work on. For the rest, when it comes to the, to the partners, of course, there we are deeply involved with Georgia in particular, who is a front runner, working hard in supporting the reforms here. And I think that is what we're going to continue to do and, and should do. Finally, when it comes to relations with the United States, I think one thing that has happened over the last, say, couple of months is that there has been a, a bit of a soul searching on how important those relations are, probably on both sides of the Atlantic, when it comes to trade, when it comes to numbers of people who are employed in the United States due to investments from the EU and the other way around, when it comes to how we can meet challenges of security and how we can meet and defend the multilateral system that we so vividly have built up together. And uh, that means that we are going to continue on that, on that track, I think, also in the foreseeable future. I'll stop there. Well, that's, that's very succinct. I, I mean, let me, let me ask you a question on the question of being ready to be um, more than 27. Um, we saw with the association agreement with Ukraine that um, a relatively small number of people in the Netherlands were able to block the ratification of the association agreement with Ukraine in order to extract from, um, from the EU, in effect, a statement that Ukraine would not, uh, you know, would not become a member eventually. Um, does that set a de facto limit to Europe? I mean, the, the Treaty on European Union says that any European country that subscribes to the values and principles of the EU is eligible to apply. But are we setting a de facto limit as to what counts as a European country now? I think what's important is to look on what is on the agenda. And when we look on agenda, there are uh, six countries in the Western Balkans who are in the path towards joining the EU. And there is one country which we have agreed to have negotiations on enlargement with, on accession with. So a little bit of a difference there. And uh, when it comes to those who are the six in Western Balkan, uh, this is what we do. And that is what is also the, the, uh, the commitment from the EU in that context. So I think that's a better way of looking into that particular issue which you are raising. Mm. Okay, very good. Well, Bridget, how does it look from the, from the other side of the Atlantic? Um, you know, in the past, the, the US has traditionally supported the, the forward movement almost in step of the EU and NATO uh, after the end of the Cold War. Does that continue to be the, the way that you look on it, or is there a new, a new philosophy as to how these um, relationships should be handled? Well, thanks. Thanks, Ambassador. And I just want to start off by saying thanks to Kurt, to the McCain Institute, to Nino and EPRC, um, to the minister and the ambassadors here. It's a real pleasure to be back in Georgia to see friends inside of government and outside of government. So it's really my pleasure to be here. I do think this is one of the most interesting uh, panels, so I'm really honored to have a chance to offer the U.S. perspective. Uh, but it really does follow on what um, uh, my old boss, uh, Dan Freed, um, uh, and, and Kurt Volker talked about. But, you know, what is the value of the transatlantic community? And specifically, what's the value of this 
um, enlargement idea, which is a big, important idea. I guess I go back to the same goal uh, that Dan and Kurt talked about, which is a Europe whole, free, and at peace. Uh, this remains a very uh, critical goal, and it can be described in slightly different ways, but the idea is uh, to create an ever-widening set of democratic partners and allies to fight global threats. Um, it's a simple goal, but it's a really important one. And I do want to emphasize uh, the way I see this, and often it's, we, we focus on enlargement, whether it's EU enlargement, and I will defer to my colleagues and ambassadors on that score, even though we always like to say what we think as Americans. Uh, but I'll focus on NATO enlargement. And enlargement as a tool to achieve this goal, which, as Ambassador Danielson said, you know, fundamentally, I'm very glad that this is in Georgia's interest and that the, uh, the government and the people of Georgia have chosen this path. As everybody or many people know, I have a strong affinity uh, for Georgia. But importantly, as an American diplomat, this is also in the U.S. interest. It's in the regional interest. I believe it's in European interest to have these like-minded friends and allies. I want to just step back, and uh, I hesitate to do this with Kurt Volker and others here, but just to, to go back to the NATO Founding Act, and uh, to paraphrase that, but to provide, obviously, collective security, uh, to share and promote democratic values, and really importantly, to go back to the open door policy, which we strongly support, which all NATO members support, but to allow, similar to the EU, I think, Lisbon European Union Treaty, but to allow any European country uh, to join, provided that it supports the aims of the treaty and provides for uh, collective security. So going back to that, the United States supports the European Euro Atlantic integration choice of countries such as Georgia, also Ukraine and Moldova in the area in which I'm, uh, I work on at the moment from this Department of State. President Trump has talked uh, multiple times uh, already about uh, the importance to the United States of every country being able to chart its own future. Uh, Vice President Biden, as Minister Izoria said, uh, came to Tbilisi at the end of July and made very clear multiple times uh, the U.S. stands by the Bucharest uh, summit commitment that Georgia and Ukraine will one day become members of NATO. Why? Why do we support this? And maybe I'll focus a little bit on Georgia. Because in, in, uh, in my experience and to my great luck, uh, some experience with Georgia, I have seen this transformation as people like Dan Freed and many uh, diplomats and others here today have seen it firsthand. And it's phenomenal what a transformation this incentive and possibility gives to countries. And again, not just because we like these countries, but this is also fundamentally in the U.S. interest. Why? I can say very clearly, because on security grounds, uh, and I see representatives of the Ministry of Defense in addition to the minister himself, uh, Georgia is with us collectively in Afghanistan with 800 and I think 72 troops. That's a very, very serious commitment. Uh, our hearts go out to those families that have lost uh, members of the military, but we are side by side in that fight, and it's a really important one. In addition to that, there's cooperation, very close cooperation on counterterrorism. There's very close cooperation uh, to try to stop the spread of nuclear uh, weapons into the hands of terrorists, and that's just on the security side. So talking about democracy, I think there's been a great debate, Ambassador Hall Hall and the others who joined, uh, and of course the Prime Minister and the President on this constitutional <coughs> issue. And uh, I, my judgment in terms of Georgia is it's come an incredibly long ways in the decade plus I've had the chance to work on Georgia. There is a ways to go. Uh, but all democracies, my own included, are, uh, are not static. And um, democracies are messy. And that's part of the challenge, maybe, but it's part of the important joy of, uh, of democracies. And so I think our goal is to help encourage Georgia along that path. Uh, I don't expect it to always be linear, <laughs> and um, I don't expect there not to be bumps in the road, 
But I think uh, certainly if you look at the span of time over successive Georgian governments, and I stress again, uh, I've had the great chance to work with people inside of government, outside of government. That's not true in the entire region with which I work. And I think that's a, the hallmark of democracies, peaceful transfers of power uh, and changes like that. And I really uh, commend and admire Georgia for achieving that, uh, among other really important things. And then I guess I go back to the beginning and to say, you know, is this important to, uh, to the United States, to Europe in the midst of a migration crisis, terrorism, on internal, with, within us, uh, Russian aggression, which is increasing, plus North Korea, all the other uh, threats and challenges out there. I would argue very strongly, very personally, uh, and on behalf of the U.S., that it's actually more important. It's more important to have these partners and allies, and it's in our, in our direct fundamental interest that we support uh, this tool of enlargement and we expand it to any country uh, that uh, wants to be a part of uh, this great experiment of uh, NATO and, and the European Union for the benefit of all of us collectively. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, that's a, a pretty ringing endorsement then of, <laughs> of how things are. Uh, I mean, let me ask you, the, uh, you know, your president when he went to Warsaw um, was at least implicitly rather critical of the, of the European Union. And certainly some of his advisors um, have suggested that actually uh, it really wouldn't matter if the European Union fell apart. In fact, the president himself said that during the, uh, the election campaign, though I think not subsequently. So uh, is it now the kind of the settled view of the administration that actually the continued process of, of parallel enlargement um, is, is a good thing, is something that actually the US should support? I'm, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I want to um, be a little careful about commenting on behalf of the Americans for European enlargement. That's, of course, a European decision. We respect that. We respect the sovereign decisions of democratic countries. I would say I can tell you uh, on NATO enlargement, which is something we directly are involved in, uh, we have uh, in every administration, including in my current administration, including the president, including the vice president, strongly endorsed uh, our existing policies, our treaty commitments, Article 5, of course, with existing allies, and uh, as Vice President Pence did, the Bucharest Summit commitment uh, specifically toward Georgia. Okay. Well ducked. <laughs> Okay, uh, Ambassador Meyer Harting, um, as I said at the beginning, you have more conflicts to deal with, I guess, in your region than probably any of the other managing directors, maybe except perhaps Africa. Um, you know, how, do, how do these questions look from your side, and how is the cooperation with the United States now on, um, on dealing with the problems of the, the region that you have to look at? Well, thank you very much, uh, um, Ambassador. Although this is precisely a relationship that I not deal, deal, don't deal with directly beyond, obviously, my regional responsibilities, I wanted to start with commenting on what you said about transatlantic turbulence. And I wanted to, say, I wanted to quote the High Representative, Mrs. Mogherini, who in fact said that, uh, quite recently that the transatlantic relationship is strong and it is strong beyond changes in administrations on either side of the Atlantic. And I do have to say, obviously, uh, we are disturbed when the United States uh, leaves the Paris Climate Accord, the Climate Agreement. But on the other hand, I see a considerable deal of continuity, very strong continuity, precisely in the areas that I cover, in foreign policy in general, by the way, on Syria, on North Korea, but obviously also on issues like Ukraine. Clearly, we saw the appointment of Ambassador Volker uh, as a sign of this continuity uh, in our relationship in working on Ukraine. I have the privilege of working with Bridget in the 5 plus 2 format on the Transnistrian settlement. This is also something where we are completely eye to eye, and this is true for our entire Eastern partnership. So that's the first point uh, I wanted to make. Uh, the, the second point uh, I wanted to make is that 
uh, because there are some misunderstandings in this field as well. We are not in the business of offering countries what we call binary choices. I mean, the, the Russians accuse us all the time that we're telling country A or B or Georgia, by the way, uh, that they have to choose between us and them. This is simply not the case. The Eastern Partnership is an offer which makes it possible for countries to come as close as they can and as they want uh, to come to us. And there's an element of differentiation because, you know, there are some Eastern partners who have chosen uh, a closer model, in particular uh, Georgia with the association agreement and the deep and comprehensive uh, free trade area and others who are less uh, ambitious. But all of these relationships, in our uh, opinion, are compatible with good relations with the neighbor in the north or in the east, wherever you are geographically. We just concluded an agreement with Armenia Armenia is a member of the Eurasian Economic uh, Union and we were able to do this. We don't see, I have to be frank, the same willingness of, uh, to make these relationships combinable uh, on the other side. Will you remember the months-long efforts we went through with Ukraine uh, to achieve uh, arrangements that made it possible for Ukraine to have a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with us, and on the other hand, free trade relations with the Commonwealth of Independent States and Russia. It didn't work out, uh, but not because of us, if I may say so. We invested an incredible amount of energy. And the third point I wanted to make, and I think it's an essential point uh, as well, is that we're in this region for the long haul. I mean, um, the, you, as uh, uh, Director General Danielson has already said that the, uh, uh, that the President of the Commission today uh, in fact made exactly the point that the European Union will not end uh, at 27. It's true that the uh, consensus uh, for this enlargement does not exist at this point in time in the European Union beyond the Balkans. But by the way, just to be particularly pre to be precise on what you quoted on Ukraine, what the European Council said last December was not foreclosing anything. The European Council said that what we have with Ukraine so far, which is the association agreement, does not in itself uh, constitute a step uh, towards uh, candidate status or mem membership. I think that point is also important to make. We are, engaged in, we are engaged in Georgia in very many ways. We are engaged in particular as, uh, in, in, in the defense of uh, Georgian uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. The UN, EU monitoring mission is in fact the only international presence here on the ground and I think it plays a very important role when it comes to dealing with uh, crisis situations on the administrative borderline and we're also involved in the uh, Geneva uh, international discussions through our European Union special representative who in fact has the lead role uh, in this process. We also, uh, just sorry, just to mention this point, um, just to mention this point, we also uh, cooperate with Georgia in the framework of the common security and defense policy and we appreciate in the same way that NATO appreciates the engagement of Georgia, we appreciate the engagement of Georgia in uh, various uh, African missions that we have in particular which is very important for us and a sign of this good cooperation and when I, wor when I worked as head of the delegation of the European Union at the United Nations we had a very close cooperation with Georgia in the multilateral sphere. But the essential point I wanted to make is that what this is about is about helping to make Georgia resilient. The concept of resilience is in fact the core principle in the European global strategy. And you asked about my experience with Russia because it's true that I also deal with the Russian file. And a year ago, over a year ago, we established a number of principles on our relationship with Russia. One of them being that there can be no substantial change uh, with, uh, in relations with Russia until Minsk is uh, fully implemented, another one being about selective engagement, but one also being that a corollary of our relationship uh, is, uh, uh, with, with Russia is to have strong relations with our Eastern partners. Making Eastern partners resilient is a very important policy for us, also in the overall regional context. And everything that we are doing, everything that uh, the Director General, uh, that uh, Director General Danielson leads, does the financial support, the economic support, the support for the rule of law, uh, the, the support uh, uh, for all sorts of reforms, democratic reforms, etc. This is in fact key and I, I think I can say uh, with all due respect uh, to our American friends that nobody is engaged to that extent in Georgia as we are. Thank you. Very good. Well, that's, that's very good to hear as well. Um, 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested, uh, you, you mentioned the, the work that you do with the United States in the 5 plus 2 process on, uh, on Moldova. Um, I mean, the EU itself is not a party to the, the Minsk talks, and neither is the, is the US. Um, we now have uh, Ambassador Volker uh, as the special representative dealing with that. Um, do you think there should be an enlarged role for the, um, for the EU, or you know, is the place that you are in terms of um, support for Ukraine's development the best place for the, for the EU? Well, I think that one thing one learns uh, in, in inter international relations is that one has to work with the formats that exist and that are. And in our opinion, there is no alternative at this stage uh, to the Normandy format. The United States is supporting the efforts of the Normandy format through Ambassador Volker. We are doing it in our own way, and we are deeply engaged in Ukraine. I mean, everything that I said about Georgia, about uh, resilience, is, a, if I may say so, at least as true with regard to our engagement in Ukraine. But on the other hand, there are specific activities in the, uh, in the Minsk context the economic context, the humanitarian context, where the European Union plays a massive role, and should there at one point uh, be a possibility uh, to, uh, to bring together again uh, Ukraine in its entirety under the control of the government, there will be a massive effort of reconstruction in which the European Union will clearly also play a key role. Very good. Okay, we have about five or six minutes, so I'll, I think I'll take one round of questions and then let people say a, a last word from the, from the panel here. So, is there a question out there somewhere? I'm trying to see some hands. Okay, we've stunned you all into silence. Can that possibly be true, that there is not a single question? Ambassador Freed, now it's gonna be a difficult question. I'm gonna regret this, aren't I? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess you will. Um, I wanted to ask directly of the Commission. All the past three days, my Georgian colleagues have asked us whether the road to NATO and to Europe is still open to them. Can you give them, if not an assurance, confidence that if they do their part with the reforms, that that road is, the road to EU membership ultimately is, is open and viable. And what do you want us Americans to tell, in and out of government, to tell the Georgians about that? Okay, I'll give you a moment to think about that. <laughs> I told you it'd be hard. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Kubilius. Perhaps I will continue what, what Dan asked uh, and what I was uh, mentioning a little bit during, during previous session. During our conversations uh, outside of conference with uh, Prime Minister and, and President, we had Lithuanian delegation such a privilege, uh, we saw that Prime Minister is very good in uh, showing uh, PowerPoint presentations with Georgian uh, numbers. Uh, economic, uh, World Economic Forum, you know, um, uh, doing business and so on and so on. And we asked very simple, uh, I don't know, we gave advice or we asked some, some assistance from Prime Minister and President to prepare special presentations which would show, for example, uh, uh, Georgian military readiness for NATO membership if to compare it with Montenegro, when Montenegro was accepted. And also because we see that really Europe will do a good job, push, you know, for uh, Western Balkans membership in EU, we are absolutely in favor of that. We asked also to prepare, you know, special presentation with Georgian numbers, with Georgian readiness for EU membership and to compare with, you know, nice countries in Western Balkans. Our uh, thought is that perhaps those presentations will show that countries are equal, or in some cases, perhaps even Georgia will be better. So, and my question is very simple. What uh, you will do when we shall come to Brussels with such presentations? 
<laughs> okay. Very good. Okay, do we have one more question? Okay, I can see a hand somewhere near the back. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, hi, my name is Sandra Kaduri. I'm an independent consultant. Um, I haven't read completely, but the European Commission President Juncker set out some plans for closer political and economic integration going forward. Is this a moment to be uh, espousing that, or should we be consolidating what Europe means for the existing members right now? I'm just worried that there are plenty of people in Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, who don't even agree to the current EU vision, um, specifically on migration and immigration issues. Shouldn't we consolidate, make sure everyone is on board with where we are right now before we move forward with a, a much okay. closer and ambitious vision? Okay, thank you very much. Before I put the, uh, the Commission and possibly the External Action Service on the spot, I, I just want to ask um, Defence Minister Azoria if he wants to respond to the, the question of whether you are already telling NATO uh, or NATO member states um, you know, that you are beyond, say, a country like Montenegro in your, in your readiness. Marlowe Baki Twist Twist, Miarmida Mikerzo Bulivico, Amitom Amki Twist Passos Gautsem, American General Bis Shepa Sebit, Rudisats Me, Kuka Samjer Gahti, Tertitlis Gano Loba Shalganici, Wismen, Mat Shepa Sebebs, Twenty Jaris Katsebis Misa Martit, Isini Quella Nair Mutkona, Sakma of Tileben, Misa Rasasquia. NATO Sulpasovani, Kvernis, Jaris Katsida Opitzer. Aram Holod Ministry, Aramed, Kartweli Halki, Amakops, Amik Tsebit, Romas, Chuen, Chuen Haner Tadmiwachet, Am Professionalism, Am Standard Abyss, Chamukalibe Bisakmeshi, the Guinda Rom, Chuen Haner Tad, we got Tana Monazile, Emisarum, Soplio, Osupro Sapto. The twenty professionalism, the twenty democratic Harris Hikos Mzar, the Amitom, the Sakurolia Chum Zadwar, the presentation of Shoknat, the Brussels, the Sarodinot, Swakwak Neptan Shedar with Magram, Amshem Troashi, Megamudivar, twenty Gainer Lebis, Shepa Sebidan, Romil Saris, Umaglesi, Romil Saris, Samakoti told Trentaganistus. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now you've had time to think. <laughs> Thank you for giving me time to reflect. No, the uh, very good questions. I think I'll start with the last one. Uh, now, when it comes to the, to the uh, discussions that are underway on, uh, on the future, that has always been the case in the European Union. Uh, but right now, it is an interesting moment. Uh, the Commission has taken the initiative for such a discussion. I think it was referred to by some previous speakers here. Uh, with various papers, or with you, in fact, Defence Minister, uh, various papers setting out ideas on what it could look like and inviting for a debate. I have followed with interest the ideas that have been uh, uh, put on the table by President Macron in Athens uh, only a couple of days ago. I presume that that discussion will continue, and the, the latest contribution is uh, President Juncker's speech today, in which he sets out what he believes should be the direction of such a discussion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that includes, just to hang on to your question, that, that includes issues about how the EU can be better on what it's doing, but also reflections on areas where the challenges are and where the EU needs to be more involved. And of course, for us working with partners, it's clear that this discussion will have direct repercussions in the way that we further engage with partners, because uh, very much of the same challenges are the ones that we face in in, in the discussions we have on why we are doing the kind of integration efforts we're doing and the close cooperation we have. Now, uh, uh, the, the second question from the bottom was, uh, how would we react if, uh, Prime Minister, you, you mentioned it, how would we react on, 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 on that kind of information? Very interesting, I would say, very interesting. And uh, uh, it, it shows, in the case of Georgia, uh, I think if we would do with such, uh, such an analysis, we would find that Georgia is a front-runner, not only among the 
countries who are in, in its group, so to say, if I can use that term, but the front runner internationally uh, on issues relating to e-governance and part of that, on issues relating to some part of the public administration and so on and so forth, and that's very good. But I think we need to remember that the efforts we are doing with partners, and Georgia in particular, is about supporting you in the reforms efforts that you would like to do. And those reforms efforts happens to be inspired, and we are very happy for by, the Europe, by, the, by what Europe stands for. And of course, one of the objectives with it is that you should be much more integrated in the European market. We should have much more dialogue. We should be much closer to each other. And that leads me to the last question. Uh, I think it's, it's my simple answer to that one would be to say it is not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda today, that issue that you raised, Ambassador Fried, uh, and that's how it stands. And then we can all, all, I mean, if you would ask, I presume, a country that I know best, I happen to be a Swede, you would find people there saying that it probably should be on the agenda. And you would find other member, in the other member states a different point of view. And as EU functions, this kind of issues we are moving forward on with unanimity, and when people are firmly behind it, and, and as it stands today, this is not on the agenda, so therefore we're not discussing it. We're discussing instead how we can, on the basis of what we have, can further strengthen our cooperation. Okay, do you want to well, add uh, Thank you. Uh, perhaps I can approach the, the same question with, a, in a certain sense, similar answer from another angle, because I would like to start with what you said about the Balkans. I mean, I think that one has to understand that the position of the European Union, and in particular of the European institutions, with regard to the Balkans was shaped by the, uh, the experience of the 1990s, and that there's a firm conviction that the process of integration is an essential element to guarantee peace and stability in that part of Europe as well. And the Balkans countries have basically a promise which goes back to 2004 that, they will, that the Western Balkans will be part of the European Union, as the European Council said in Thessaloniki, 13 years ago. And I mean, it's a very long process and it has taken time. And it's an important step that the, uh, that the President of the European Commission has said today that we won't end at 27. Mrs. Mogherini said something quite similar uh, some time ago. So I, said, I think in a certain sense, one also has to have historic patience when you discuss these issues. Um, it is true that for, for the, at, at this point in time, the last time the heads of state and government expressed themselves in Riga, basically, they said that they are fully aware of the aspirations, the European aspirations of these countries, and of course they also welcome, they said in some cases, the European choices of these countries. They haven't got beyond these phase, and I don't think that at this stage there is a consensus, as you rightly said, in the European Council to go beyond this stage. But as I said, um, what we are doing here is an engagement of, for the long term. We are helping uh, Georgia uh, to consolidate itself even further, to become resilient, to strengthen itself, and this is an investment into the future of Georgia, whatever happens. But it is true that if Georgia wants to keep its perspectives open in the future, this is an a, a investment that is also beneficial in this sense. Very good. Bridget, do you want to have the, uh, the last word? Um, it, it, talking, this discussion reminded me a little, Ambassador Kelly and I were talking about when he first came to Georgia, and I think he said 1986? 76. So I was pretty young then, but uh, we were talking about how much it's changed over a relatively short period of time and how phenomenal that is. And maybe just to um, amplify and, and uh, underscore some of what my uh, EU colleagues had said and to provide a little more hope and encouragement on the Georgian side is that the way I see it in my 22 or so years in diplomacy and with a long-term relationship with Europe is that this is the long game. And the United States plays a part, Georgia plays a part, Europe plays a part. We have the right values. We're fighting for the right things. When I look around in Georgia, in Ukraine, and other places, and I look at the future, I see the youth, and I am incredibly inspired and, and heartened uh, by where this is going to go. And it's important that we just all stick at it and keep going. Thanks. Great. Well, that's a very good, upbeat note to, uh, to end on. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you, Ian Bond, for great moderating.
Um, thank you to Christian and Thomas for making the trip here. You will not find two more thoughtful and engaging people on EU issues in Georgia than the two of them. And now it is our coffee break. We'll resume here at 4.30.